wisdom that we and our world may be well. forgives us and continues to come to us offering choices as to how we will choose to live and what we will choose to believe. Let us do the work of preparing ourselves to hear, see, and better understand what God is offering to us. Amen. As a sign of our reconciliation with God and with one another. Please turn to whomever you are with or to the whole wide world and pass the peace of Christ. Peace be with you. Peace. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Peace.
the work of the young this morning, I, I think this is a really good one. I just, not to chew my own horn, I'm just thinking for, you know, the, this is a good Bible story, or a good message is what I, what I intended to say. The story from the Bible that Reverend John is going to preach from today, um, in that story, Jesus compares growing seeds to faith that is growing inside of us. And one of the ways that Jesus does this, I think it's a really fantastic image, a great, a great comparison, um, is, is through seeds growing in the ground like a garden. Um, and we can use the example of our own garden right here at St. Paul's. We've got all of these volunteers of all different ages, all different abilities, and they come and they help to tend our garden. And what does that mean to tend a garden? What, what do you do? Well, they get the ground ready and they plant the seeds and they water all of the plants and they pull the weeds out and they harvest the fruits and the vegetables when, when it's time to, to harvest them and they deliver them to the people who, who need them to eat. There's all of these different things that they do. They don't just, you know, throw some seeds out there and, and say, okay, that's good, call it a day. That's, that's, I mean, I guess maybe a couple of those seeds might grow, but it's a lot better, much fuller garden. They do all of that tending if they actually care for the seeds that, that have been planted. Well, faith is a lot like that. So, you know, God sort of, you know, plants a seed in all of us, a faith seed, not a real seed but a faith seed inside of us, but we don't just sort of sit around and say, okay, that was terrific. We have to, have to help grow the faith that, that's within us. Cultivate, that's sort of a big word, but I think it's a really wonderful word for growing faith, cultivating it. So how do we do that? You know, we, we don't water our faith, sort of. We don't weed it. But what, what does that look like? Well, some things that we can do is we can try to follow what God is calling us to do. So caring for our neighbor, that's a good way to cultivate faith. Um, helping somebody who's hurt, that's a good way to help to tend to grow our faith. When we hurt somebody, when we hurt their feelings, we apologize. And then we try to make, we try to make it better. We try to do it differently in the future. That's a good way to cultivate. Other things that we can do, we can pray, we can read or listen to Bible stories, we can worship. These are all those different ways that we grow and tend to our faith. When we have really, really interesting, hard questions and we're not sure, oh, can I ask that question about God? Absolutely. Asking questions is one of the best ways that we can grow and cultivate our faith. These are all wonderful, wonderful ways to help us tend to that faith garden that's inside of us. So I hope that you will, you will work at tending your faith garden. We're all going to work together with that. Just like the garden at St. Paul's, you don't have to do it alone, right? You've got all of these people in this community who, who are here to help, help one another's faith to grow. And so we, we do that together, and we do it with the help of God. Let us pray. God, thank you so much for planting the seeds of faith inside of us. And help us to help those seeds to, to grow. Help us to do the things that you're calling us to do so that we can, can help faith to flourish in our hearts and in the hearts of our neighbors. Amen. Daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padanaram, 
sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer, and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, with his hand gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man, living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I'm famished. Therefore, he was called Edom. Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I'm about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank, and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Here ends the reading from the book of Genesis. Please let us listen for the word of God as it is found in Psalm 119, verses 105 to 112. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it, to observe your righteous ordinances. I am severely afflicted, giving me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your ordinances. I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your decrees are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever, to the end. Here ends the reading of the book of Psalms. May God bless our hearing and living of these words. Amen. Mm -hmm.
God is still speaking. Thanks. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Jesus tells a parable in our third scripture passage. And whenever Jesus tells parables, it is with the understanding that the people who are listening, who are hearing him speak, have a, have a basic understanding of what he's talking about. In this third parable, as Alyssa mentioned, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, planting seeds and uh, things that grow and why things grow and why they might not grow. Many of the people Jesus was originally talking to were people who were, if they were farmers, they were people who planted uh, gardens in order to have at least a little something specific for their families to eat. So they had a pretty good idea uh, of what it meant to try to grow things. Now today, perhaps we do and perhaps we don't. Um, I know that even though I grew up in South Jersey, which was a, a major uh, farming area, I had little to no idea what it took to grow a vegetable or even a, uh, a plant or a flower. Um, and it wasn't really until living in Maine and marrying Sue that I got a little bit better understanding of that. Now we're fortunate here um, at St. Paul that even if we haven't had that personal experience with growing things, we do have our community garden. And, and we, we talk about what goes on out there. Uh, we understand that in order for our community garden to grow, it takes a lot of work uh, for that to be accomplished. Uh, it doesn't just happen on its own. There are not a bunch of elves that uh, kind of hang out outside and, and make sure everything's right with the garden. Uh, they don't come in in the middle of the night and pick weeds or water or harvest things. Uh, all that requires the work of members of our congregation. And people sign up and volunteer to do that. And because they do, because they have put the work in, because they have prepared the soil well, because they have taken care of the plants, and the vegetables that are there, we have uh, vegetables and fruit that grows that we can harvest and that we can then share with other people, people who might not have uh, fresh vegetables otherwise. Jesus is speaking to his followers, to his listeners, with this understanding that they know how gardens work how gardening works, how growing things work. So as we listen this morning, I would hope that we keep that image of our community garden in, in our mind and that we recognize what needs to, to take place for things to grow. So I'd ask that you might listen for the Word of God as it is found in the Gospel according to Matthew, we're reading from the 13th chapter. We're going to read first verses 1 through 9, and then verses 18 through 23. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat beside the city. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. 
other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Let anyone with ears listen. And Jesus continued later, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word, and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. May God bless this reading from Holy Scripture to our understanding. So we hear about what happens when the seed falls on different types of soil. And Jesus describes what happens basically when it falls on soil where it doesn't, it doesn't take root. Um, when, when it falls on the, uh, hard, the hard packed path, it doesn't grow, the birds eat, eat it right away. When it falls on rocky ground, it, there's not enough soil, so the seed doesn't really have any root, and it uh, grows, but it almost immediately dies because it's lacking that root. When it's sown in soil that has weeds, the weeds choke out whatever grows, and it dies off that way. But in the good soil, it, um, it grows, and sometimes it grows so well that the harvest is a hundredfold or 60 or 30 or various numbers they use. So I think in part what we, we need to ask ourselves is when Jesus talks about these seeds, what is he, what's he talking about? And, uh, and that's part of the beauty of parables is that it forces us to ask questions like this and, and there can be a number of different answers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work with the idea that what Jesus is talking about as far as the seeds are the seeds that when they're planted and take hold help God's kingdom come further into being. God's kingdom come further into being. God's dream for the world come further into being. And so those seeds that are, are sown, that are planted, are, are that which helps um, that come to be. So it's important, it's important for us to recognize uh, why those seeds might not grow and why they or how they can. Now, the examples he uses are, they, they're pretty powerful once we, we start to dig in a little bit. Because Jesus says, uh, you know, the first the seeds fall on the hard path earth, or a hard path, path. When, when the ideas that God is trying to share with us, when the, the guidance that God is trying to give to us, the, uh, the, perhaps the new ways of thinking, the new ways of acting in the world, when God shares that with us, and the seeds fall on hard packed earth, it's like it's like when we're, we have convinced ourselves that there's nothing else for us to learn. You know, we, we, everything's, everything's good the way it is. This, is. this is what I was taught. This is what I believe. This is good for the rest of my life. Our soil is really, really hard packed. And so those seeds don't enter in at all. And, uh, and they don't take root. Or 
it can be like when the, the, the soil is so rocky that there's not a lot of places for the, the seed to have enough soil to take root. Uh, those rocks can be things that have, uh, that we have been taught over time, that we, uh, that we understood to be true and perhaps that was understood to be true by the people who taught them. But if we look at them honestly, they're, they're really, they're not true. And they're not, they're not true of God and they're not true of people. And, and these are things that, uh, that are in our way for taking root of what God is trying to teach us today. Or when, when those seeds of what God are, is trying to teach us today fall in soil that has a lot of weeds. And it's interesting the way that Jesus describes that there. Those weeds are that which the world says is important. Uh, pursuing uh, power or position, pursuing wealth solely, where we don't think about anything else, where we don't focus on anything else. And then the weeds have, they have, because they get more attention, because all those other pursuits get more attention, they grow and they grow better or stronger than the actual seeds that are planted that are God's seeds and they choke that out and then we're told that the seeds that are planted in good soil grow and they, and the grain that grows or the vegetables that grow or the fruit or the flowers whatever it is that grows grows up wonderfully so the question then for us is you know how do we cultivate good soil what is it that we have to do ourselves so that the soil that's within us, our internal soil, can receive the seeds that God is seeking to plant in us, sow in us? What can we do? Well, I think we go back to those examples and we recognize that we have, we have work to do. And we recognize that this is this is ongoing work. It's not something that just happens one time and then it's over and done. You'll, any gardener that you talk to, any person that, a farmer that will talk to you will say, uh, yes, it's very important to uh, cultivate the soil initially, to get it started, but you gotta keep, you gotta keep working. When our community garden first began, it was, Part of a field that was covered with grass, and there was a whole lot of work that had to be done in order to get that soil ready. And people understood, and they went ahead and they did that. They did the hard work that was necessary to get the soil ready so it could grow. And that's what we have to understand is necessary as well. We have to be willing to do the hard work to allow our soil to become soil that will receive what God is offering to us, the calls that God is offering to us, the guidance that God is offering to us, the new insights that God is offering to us. We have to allow for the hard-packed soil that fills up in our life to be broken down. We have to allow for that to happen. If we don't, nothing gets in, nothing gets through. We have to be willing to clean out the rocks, clean up the rocks, pull the rocks out of the soil that's, that have accumulated over time. And those rocks can be, they can be very strong and they can, and they can be hard to move. They are lessons that we've been taught, beliefs that we've been taught that have their reasons for whatever reason we were taught them. But they're not, they're not true where they're not true in the way that they were taught. And so we have to be willing to pick them up and move them to the side. And that's not always easy. That's not always an easy thing. Breaking down the, the hard-packed earth, removing the rocks, is not an easy thing. But if we want the seeds that God is sowing to grow, we've got to do that work. And we have to recognize that our soil, our interior, internal soil,
can get choked with weeds as well. None of us are immune to hearing what the world is calling us. And what the world is saying is most important. None of us are, uh, none of us just cast that off. And, and oftentimes, what we hear, even though it's contrary to God's word and God's hope for the world, it, they take hold. So this, this idea that we have to pursue uh, positions of power at any cost, that can take our attention away from what God is asking us to do, of the equality that God is asking us to, to search for and to try to make happen in the world. The pursuit of wealth, solely focusing on the pursuit of wealth, can stop us, can choke out the idea that God has planted in us that what we are supposed to be seeking to have happen in our world is that all have enough and all can live life fully. So we have to be very conscious of, of identifying what those weeds are because you don't want to pull out the good stuff, but you do want to get rid of the weeds. So you have to understand what they are, and then you have to remove them. When we talk about how it is that we want to pursue a world in which uh, all people are seen as equal, all people are treated as equal, all people are accepted as to who they are, we have to recognize the weeds that have choked out our ability to do that, the biases that have stopped us from doing that, the prejudices that we carry within that, the privilege that we have. And this is, these are things that have been planted within us for a long time. They are a part of our soil, and they can produce very strong weeds that will choke out or attempt to choke out any, any attempt to see people differently, to treat people differently to try to break down the structures that reinforce racism. We have to recognize those weeds and we have to be willing to pull them out if we want the seeds that God is planting to grow. We want that good soil. We know that. And we have have made attempts to cultivate that good soil, to build that good soil up. We come to church, we read our Bibles, we, we went to Sunday school, we go to Sunday school, we pray. But there are times, I think, that we think that, well, if we've done it once or if we've done it twice, then we're good to go. We really don't have to keep working it. We don't have to keep tending our interior, internal soil. And that's just not true. And our farmers and our gardeners will tell you, each and every year you have to break down the soil that's hardened up. Each and every year you gotta pull rocks out. Each and every year you have to weed. And you gotta, you gotta water. And you have to add fertilizer, compost, that's hard work. It's hard work, it's hot work, it can be stinky work, it can be work that we wish we didn't have to do. But if our hope and goal is to raise fruits and vegetables that we can share, if our hope and goal is that we hear what God is sharing with us today and how God is asking us to live and work today, if our hope is to be a part of those people who bring about God's dream today, then we have to be willing to do the work. And we have to get after it. And we have to do it. If it's not daily, it's regularly. Now there is some good news in the midst of all this. Because there's a lot of, a lot of talk about how hard this is. But we have to remember that our our ground has been broken. It has been. It has been tilled up. We've taken out some of the rocks. 
we've done some weed, and we've been through an o &A process. We've tried to live into that over, over time. And we've, we've got better at it. Are we 100%? Not yet. But are we working towards it? Absolutely. Is there more work to be done? Yes, there is. But as Alyssa was saying, it's not work that we do on our own. No one person, no one person could possibly tend to the community garden around, all on their own and take care of it. No one person, even when we try really, really hard, we can't make our soil as good as it can be on our own. We need the help of others. And we need to remember that it's, it's an ongoing process. It's not something we do one time and we're done. We learn some, we grow. We learn some, we grow. We serve, we grow. We reach out and help other people, we grow. We face our prejudices. We recognize how in the past we have, we have looked at LGBTQ people or we've looked at people of different color, different races. We've looked at people of different economic statuses. We've looked at them and we've made judgments about them before we've even said a word to them or gotten to know them. And we recognize that's not how we should be living and acting in the world. And so we need to do the work so we do that less and less. And then we help others do that less and less. Our soil has, we have been working on it. And it's produced good fruit. It's produced good grain. It's produced good vegetables. And we want to continue to do that. And in order for that to be true, we need to keep working on our soil. Let us commit. Let us commit to not only cultivating our community garden in a way that can grow things that can feed people, but let us cultivate our interior garden so that God's word, God's hopes, God's guidance for each of us can grow so that we can feed others as well. As we prepare our hearts and spirits for prayer, we would ask that in particular we might keep in our prayers all the health care providers throughout our state, throughout our country, throughout the world. We pray that God will help them deal with the ongoing stress of caring for so many people, of witnessing the ebbs and flows and in many places now. Uh, the huge increases in the numbers of people who are, are ill with COVID. We recognize, too, that they are dealing with limited resources, and we pray that God will help them to do the best they can with those resources, and that, that we as a whole might provide more of those resources to them. We ask, too, that, that God might be with each and every one of us, all people, that we might choose to be more responsible in the following of, of rules to wear masks and keep social distance. We recognize that we each and all have a choice in this matter. And that in many ways our, our fierce independence makes us often think of what we want as more important than what is good for the whole. And so we'd ask that God might help one and all to see that we, we can be responsible for each other's well-being by making those choices. 
We pray too that we might be, that God might be with Aunt Joanne, um, who is battling sepsis. Um, we pray that the antibiotics that she's taking will have a positive effect. We pray for Virginia's family who recently died. We pray for Cheryl and Alex and Nicholas. We pray that Cheryl's biopsy that comes back this week might provide hopeful news. We continue our prayers for Bobby. We pray too for Diane, who is home from the hospital after uh, being hospitalized because of an extreme feeling of dizziness. We pray too for the, the friends of, of Grace. Uh, Grace, who was a member of our congregation for a number of years and has been uh, in a care facility for a, a good number of years recently. Uh, her, her funeral was down in Gettysburg uh, and uh, it's one of those things that sometimes in the process of uh, preparing for a funeral and, uh, and sharing words at a, a funeral or a graveside service like this was, you come to new insights. We had known that Grace, at one point in time, played violin for the Harrisburg Symphony Orchestra, uh, which is an incredible accomplishment for any musician to play in a, a symphony orchestra like that. Um, and, and Jock used to talk about how Grace would have some Civil War souvenirs, and things that she had found because she grew up on a farm uh, close to the battlefield of Gettysburg. Um, it wasn't until I I read that Grace's maiden name is Spangler, that I realized that she not only grew up close to the battlefield of Gettysburg, she grew up on the battlefield of Gettysburg. Um, and an interesting, just an interesting way of seeing this, the circle of life come around. So we, we pray for all, all her friends and we're grateful that she and, and Jock are now, um, now reunited. We do have some celebrations that we want to raise up. We want to um, celebrate the Hayden's test results came back. They were good, and she's feeling better. We want to thank everyone who has uh, signed up for altar flowers. Um, fortunately, folks have signed up for all of, of July and August, so those those will be delivered to different people. And, uh, and you know, again, so you all know. Uh, the, these deliveries are made so that social distance is maintained. Um, people can come to the door, people can come outside, but the folks who are delivering will have masks on. And uh, um, so we're grateful to be able to, to share some of the beauty that's present here in the sanctuary with, with folks. And we also want to thank everyone who has signed up to work in the garden. Um, as we mentioned, there is the work day this coming Thursday, and there are lots of spots for July and for August where we need folks to go out and weed and water and harvest. Um, each and all of us can participate in that, and we hope that if you're able, that you'll do so. Let's join our hearts and spirits in prayer. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for your presence within us and amongst us here. And we recognize that your spirit within us, as it stirs our spirits, is always seeking to teach us, is always seeking to guide us, is always seeking to open, open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our spirits, our minds, to seeing the world as you would have us see it acting in the world as you would have us act. And we do recognize that there are things that get in the way of that. That the soil in which this wisdom of yours that's planted in us holds barriers and that we have to break through those. Break through the hardened and toughened earth break through the rocks and the weeds of our soul and our spirits. Be 
Be with us as, as we do this work. Give us the strength and the courage to face that which is hard to face, to engage in what is hard to engage, and to remember that in doing so, we are indeed allowing what you have planted in us to grow. And that that which that you planted, that grows in us, can feed people in so many different ways. Help us, help us to be about this good work. We believe that you hear the prayers we offer to you aloud and also all the prayers we offer to you in silence. And so now we turn to you in that silence. Most gracious and holy God, we give you thanks for our faith that teaches us that you hear all our prayers and you respond to them all. May we receive the care, the compassion, the guidance, the peace and the love that you offer to us. May it take root in our soul. And as these gifts continue to grow within us, May we choose to share each and every one of them with all who we meet. We offer you this prayer and all our prayers in your most gracious and holy name. In the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
not to that tune. I guess those of us of a certain age would say, see, you don't. Um, Mary, did you recognize that song? <laughs> <laughs> I, we had looked for the Godspell version of that, and we just we couldn't find it, um, which was really disappointing, because wouldn't it have been wonderful to hear Mr. Dundor's voice singing that wonderful bass part? Oh, it would have Great. But I am not going to attempt to sing it in, in that tune because that would ruin the experience, I'm afraid. I, uh, as I was putting together the song or this, uh, this sermon this morning, I was, uh, I was imagining the people who have said that when they listen to the, the service, they go outside and they, uh, they're they're wandering around, perhaps they're sitting on a porch or on a deck, or maybe they're, they're walking in their, their flower beds or their, their gardens. Because I, when Jesus tells these stories, when he, when he shares this with the people who are listening, as we heard in the story, they're outside. They're on a beach or they're in a field somewhere or they're on a mountain somewhere. The examples he uses are the examples that people see around them day in and day out so that they're reminded on a regular basis of what he is sought to be teaching them. The idea that, that we need to, to cultivate the soil that's within us so that we can receive the gifts that God is giving us, the guidance that God is giving us, the calls that God is, is putting forward to us. That we're reminded but day in and day out by what we see that this is true and that this is what we need to be doing. So if you're inside now, the next time you're outside, allow yourself to make that connection. Allow yourself to be reminded and allow yourself to ask, what is it today that I'm doing to help make my soil ready? to receive the seeds that God is planting in me. For all that is growing within us, all that God has planted that's growing within us is needed, that God's dream for the world is to become reality. Let us, let us be a part of that, of that creation, of that growing.